Okay, everybody. So, yeah, once again, my name is Steve Parr. I'm a corporate lawyer in Vancouver, and uh, this is Ryan Sahota, who's uh, who's an accountant, um, also in the Vancouver area. And uh, so, what we are covering today is wills, estates, and tax planning. So. Um, there's quite a bit of material to cover, so I just want to uh, get as much information across to you guys as possible. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. First of all, the question is, why, why do you need a will at all? So um, the short answer is that basically everybody who is an adult who has any assets whatsoever needs a will. Um, and that's regardless of how, how large or small your estate is. Um, really just comes down to choice, a question of being able to choose Who's going to manage your affairs uh, upon your upon your death? Um, somebody is going to need to do it, and if you don't do it, then it's it's just much more complicated. And we'll explore some of the reasons why it's more complicated for uh, for those that you're leaving behind. Um, the second piece is that, of course, you get to choose who gets what under a will. Um, if you don't, then there are certain rules under the Wills, Estates, and Succession Act, which is the governing legislation here in BC uh, that so they, the government essentially chooses for you if you don't take this choice into your own hands. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just briefly, what happens if you die without a will? So if you don't have a will, so uh, uh, the legislation governs it. And um, what happens that is that a person called an administrator needs to apply to the court to be appointed. So. Uh, there are certain rules under WESA that govern who can apply to be uh, to be an administrator. Uh, your spouse would be first in line for that. Um, and if your spouse is not able to do it or wishes somebody else to do it, then they can appoint somebody. Um, but there is also the risk, of course, that nobody steps up at all. And in that case, the assets can be frozen, perhaps indefinitely, and then eventually forfeited to the government. So obviously not, a, not an ideal outcome. Um, and then, uh, and then what, if you have no will and your assets are just gonna be distributed according to the le legislation, then what happens is an, a, an automatic distribution. So if you have a spouse, if you only have a spouse, then all of your assets are gonna go to your spouse. Um, and if you have a spouse and children, the first 150 to 300,000 will go to your spouse. Um, unless there are children from, from different marriages. So, uh, and then the remainder will be split between the spouse and the children, 50%, 50%. Um, for children who are under 19 years of age, the public guardian and trustee, which is a, a government body, is gonna hold the funds for minors. So not the surviving parent. So the surviving parent would actually not have control over uh, when and how those funds are released to the minor children. Um, so again, a, a fairly complicated scenario. Um, so if there are no spouse uh, or kids uh, and you die with, if you don't have a spouse or kids and you die without a will, uh, then the next in line would be your parents. If you don't have any living parents, then it would be your siblings. Uh, if there's none of those, um, it goes through various ste steps. So once there's no aunts, uncles, cousins, then eventually it just gets forfeited to the government. Uh, granted, a, a very unlikely scenario, but um, not really something you want to uh, risk occurring. So that is that. And I'll just slide to the next one. So um, valid will. So like what goes into a valid will? So a will has to be in writing. So you could record a voice memo or make a YouTube video <laughs> with, uh, with your wishes, but it's very questionable that it would be accepted whatsoever. Um, under the legislation, it needs to be in writing, needs to be signed by yourself, uh, needs to be dated. And uh, the signing requirements are quite specific under WESA, under the Act. So they, it needs to be signed in the presence of two witnesses at the same time. Uh, who are in each other's presence and the presence of yourself. So in other words, all three persons need to be in the same room. Um, of course, because of COVID, there are some digital exceptions that have been uh, created. So you can actually do this over Zoom, but it's, it's a little bit more complicated. So traditionally, yeah, all three persons are in the room at the same time. Um, and importantly, the, your witnesses cannot be beneficiaries under the will because then there would be something of a conflict of interest there. And, uh, oh, and they cannot be a spouse of a beneficiary as well. 
Um, you cannot make a will before the age of 16. You need to be at least 16 years old and your witnesses need to be 19 years old um, and you need to be of sound mind. So it's obviously beneficial to get this under wraps before, um, before we get it too advanced in age when having a sound mind might not be, you might not have it anymore. So, um, so that is what goes into having a valid will. So the que next question that I often get from clients is like, well, why do I even need a lawyer to do this? Uh, there are a lot of alternatives online and um, there are various websites that will just pump out a will. You just put in a little bit of information and then you get a will. That's great and it, it might work, but it might not. And really the, uh, the thing I wanna highlight here is that it's, this is one of the most important decisions of your life because it's gonna have probably the most significant lasting impact. Um, and so it's not, when it comes to legal work, it's not a terribly expensive uh, thing to, do, to get done, uh, but it's extremely important. So in terms of value for your dollar, it's money very well spent um, and it's best to leave it to a pro. The, the principal drawbacks from assuming that you do get a valid will from, uh, from a DIY will kit or from an online service, um, you're still not going to get any, any kind of advice regarding minimizing taxation. So um, there are certain assets that are going to fall outside of a will. Um, so we're going to touch on those more later. But uh, certain assets are such as uh, insurance policies, property that's held in a in joint tenancy, including vehicles or, uh, or homes, those are going to fall outside of the will. Uh, so it's really important that what is named as, as an asset that's going to fall inside of the will uh, is properly identified. Um, you want to get guidance on probate fees. So currently you have to pay 1.4%, roughly 1.4% of the value of the state to the government. Um, and you also want to get some guidance on potential wills variation claims. So a wills variation claim is essentially um, the right of certain persons, namely your spouse and children, to um, to vary the will. So under under WESA, there is a, a vaguely defined, but nonetheless a defined right of those persons to be treated fairly. So they're supposed to get reasonable um, uh, a reasonable amount of money from uh, from the estate. So if they are cut out of the will and it's not done in a proper way, then they can challenge the will in court and obviously that's uh, something you want to avoid through proper planning and getting the guidance of a professional. Um, so yeah, lastly, one of the problems that can arise with online wills is that people just don't sign them properly. That's probably the easiest way to mess up a will. And if it's not signed properly, then it's of no value whatsoever. Um, you can correct a deficiency. So if there was a, 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 an improperly witnessed will, it's a possibility that it could be corrected by the courts, uh, but you're looking at a minimum six to seven thousand dollar fee to get that done. So you, going into the courts is, of course, not um, not a cheap process and takes a lot of time. So that is DIY wills. So uh, I want to just briefly on probate. So probate is the process of proving that the will is valid, and this is a necessary step for um releasing assets so um the bt supreme court will will grant a probate if there's a will and that's uh that's a process that needs to be as generally supported by a lawyer it's like it, it's actually very complicated to go through the um, probate process and um it's a lot of uh a lot of t's to cross and dot and i's to dot and if there is no will then it's called a grant of administration uh, a grant of probate and a grant of administration are both types of estate grants. And, uh, and an estate grant is, is what a, the land title office, which, uh, which governs real estate, um, banks, financial institutions, ICBC, they're all gonna require an estate grant before they are going to transmit the property in question. So um, essential step that needs to be, that you need to go through uh, in terms of timeline, um, your, it generally takes between six months to a year for an estate to go through probate. So this is another reason why it's very, very helpful to, to have a will is because the process for applying for a grant of administration is a lot more onerous. It takes longer. Um, it's generally more expensive as well. 
So having a, having a will just really simplifies things. If the value of your estate is less than $25,000, there are no probate fees. So if that, you know, for a younger person who just has say a vehicle, a $5,000 vehicle, then there, there wouldn't be any fees at all. Um, but if it's over 50, between 25 and $50,000, there's a certain percentage. I believe it's uh, under 1% for, for the, that value of the estate. And then over $50,000, everything is gonna be charged a flat 1.4% in, in probate fees. So as you can imagine, uh, a, a million dollar estate is you're going to attract $14,000 uh, in probate fees. And, um, and so this is something that is going to engage some planning. If the value of the estate is, is particularly high, then it can be really uh, beneficial to think through um, how to minimize the probate fees. So number five, what is not covered by will? So yeah, again, there are certain assets um, that are not covered by will. This includes life insurance. So any, any type of um, insurance policy, critical illness, disability policies, uh, life insurance policies, these are, you're gonna want to name a beneficiary. So it's very important to have professional guidance here. Um, I have seen situations where clients have actually included um, life insurance inside of a will. And that means that the, the value of the policy, which could be millions of dollars, uh, winds up going through the will instead of being um, outside of the will, which is, which is not a good scenario at all because you have to pay probate fees on that amount. And also it, it would take much, much longer for the funds to be released to the person that, they, uh, that the will maker intended them intended the, the value of the policy to go to. Um, life insurance policies, TFSAs, RSPs, RIFs, these are all uh, accounts that should just go directly to beneficiaries and, um, and we'll you just wanna keep them out of the estate. So similarly, assets and joint tenancy. Um, when a person dies, the other person who is named as a joint tenant on the property, uh, all they need to do is, is get the, uh, the debt certificate and go to the land title office or the financial institution, and then they can um, have full ownership over that, uh, that piece of property. So that's a process that um, falls outside of the will and falls outside of the, the process of probate. So I just wanna do a little bit of a deep dive here on assets and joint tenancy with children. This is a question that comes up a lot. Um, whether, so whether uh, an elderly person should uh, have their children be registered as joint tenants on their, on their home um, in anticipation of them eventually uh, leaving this place. And um, so th this can be a beneficial strategy in terms of trying to save money on, on probate fees to, to keep that property outside of the estate. Uh, but there are, of course, several risks. Um, the most significant, of course, is what if your child decides to sell uh, half of the property before, before you've, while you're still living in it? Um, that's, that's definitely something that could occur. So, um, of course, everybody always, always thinks that their children are, don't have any issues and wouldn't ever do anything like, of that sort. But unfortunately, that does arise from time to time. Uh, so there are some potential solutions that you can work out with a professional. So such as registering a life interest. So uh, you could re register a life interest, which essentially means that it cannot be sold until uh, until you have passed. There are also some uh, some tax implications here regarding capital gains. So it's it would not be the child's principal residence. So there's no principal residence exemption from capital gains uh, from the capital gains tax. And I just saw Ryan clicked off mute. So I'll just let him speak to this here. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, Steve. Um, I think the other things too that I think everybody has to be aware of as well is especially when you try to get around uh, with just uh, like a, a very bare bones uh, joint tenancy is you want to be very careful, especially here in uh, BC, especially in the lower mainland uh, speculation tax. Um, if you are in joint tenancy, then you also want to be very, very careful in terms of any uh, general anti-avoidance rules in regards to property transfer tax as of course the province has changed those rules in the last two years. So you want to be very careful back in, uh, I guess you almost want to say like the old days, which was only five years ago, 
Um, you had the ability, of course, where this wasn't too much of an issue. Of course, now this is, especially with a lot of the new uh, residential taxes that have been kicked in at the, at the provincial level. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, uh, Ryan. Um, Ryan, I think I'll just turn it over to you at this point uh, for the section entitled Death and Taxes. Um, okay. Yeah, if that's all right, yeah. Yeah, there's no worries. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's two things, of course, that are always uh, certain in life, as, uh, as the old saying goes, and that's obviously death and taxes. Uh, we could spend a whole uh, week seminar just, just talking about, obviously, the, the tax implications upon death. And I think the main uh, point that we want to get across is, you know what, there is planning you want to take into consideration, of course, before, uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, that eventual date. Um, and you want to make sure, especially if you are a corporate owner, of course, you've done the uh, reasonable amount of planning uh, for any corporate assets that you hold, any companies, any corporate groups. Um, and of course, there's different strategies ahead of that. Uh, so what we'll do is just kind of dive in here at a very high level. So I think the first thing to remember is there's a deemed disposition on death. And as onerous as it sounds, it's actually something that a lot of people are actually not aware of. You're deemed to disposed of all your assets at their fair market value at the date just before you pass away. So the day before you pass away, you're deemed to dispose of all of your assets at their current fair market value um, by a third party. And that's how CRA assesses uh, the value of your assets. This can be a potentially large tax bill if not dealt with uh, accordingly and properly. So of course, you know, there's strategies of life insurance, there's strategies in terms of meltdown. Uh, there's different ways to kind of do a restructure or move certain assets in advance of that. We we'll be very, very careful because otherwise your estate or the beneficiaries of your estate will be left with a fairly large tax bill to pay. And of course, in BC, everybody is quite uh, gung-ho on uh, real estate right now. I mean, you could just picture where real estate is going to be in, in a couple of years. Again, these are, uh, you know, big elephants in the closet that are just sitting there in terms of just tax liability. So we'll be very careful with that. Uh, capital gains tax. So again, going back to that deep disposition, uh, any assets that are capital in nature, for example, if you have rental properties, uh, perhaps even the shares of, of a corporation or a corporate group they might hold, uh, other certain investments, uh, those are deemed at the fair market value. And those are then taxed on your final return and also on your estate's return, potentially depending on the complexity of, of your estate as a capital gain. That could be substantial. And of course, uh, as rumors are, are going around, uh, with regards to the uh, federal's possibly increasing the capital gains inclusion rate from 50% to 75%, of course, to try and fund uh, the COVID deficit, this is something that you'll want to make sure that you've got planning in place for. So it's something to, to consider as well. Uh, and that just kind of flows into the next point here that, that Steve's put together for us. And, and this is basically taking a look at what you've purchased uh, compared to where the current value is and whether or not you decide to sell ahead of time or, or, or hold on to and of course, there's much, there's a lot, there's many more other decisions that fall into place here other than, you know, just, just the tax considerations. Of course, as Steve has hinted at, there's of course going to be family uh, considerations as well. There's going to be other legal considerations rather than just, of course, just looking at from a black and white uh, tax level. So you really want to be very careful in terms of, and this is what we normally call like a meltdown strategy. You want to be very careful in terms of what you're melting down or trying to melt away from the value of your final estate while you're still living. So that, of course, is something you would do over, you know, with three or four different advisors, of course, your lawyer, uh, of course, with Steve here, uh, someone such as myself, or also your financial advisor, and make sure everything's being done in conjunction, because if it's not done correctly, you might be saving a tax, but you could be setting yourself up for potentially another uh, future liability with regards to family law, which is not fun. Um, so as, as Steve's already hinted at, uh, RSPs, RIFs, uh, TFSAs, Make sure you sit down with your financial advisor. They will actually set the beneficiary for you. TFSAs roll over on, on a tax free basis. Uh, RSPs, of course, will roll over on a tax free basis to the surviving spouse. Once that surviving spouse has passed away, uh, there is a deemed tax on the value of those RSPs or those RIFs. So it's something to be very uh, careful about, especially uh, for individuals who have built up a large value in their uh, registered accounts. Something to, to be aware of, uh, especially. Uh, principal residence exemption. So this is a little trick. Well, not really a trick, but it's, it's a little uh, tax nugget that often catches people off guard. So normally what happens in an estate is that, of course, if you have a principal residence, there's no tax on it. 
Okay, you're deemed to have disposed of your principal residence on the date that you pass away, should you still be holding on to it. So that's perfectly fine. But then it's up to the beneficiaries of the estate on how they're looking to dispose of that property. And again, depending on your estate, that property will roll into your testamentary estate, okay, based on how you're going to put your will together. And any incremental fair market value increase from the date that you pass away to the date that perhaps maybe your beneficiaries decide to sell the property is a capital gain. And I can't tell you how many conversations we've had with surprise executors, surprise beneficiaries, especially, of course, uh, out in the Maple Ridge area, Burnaby, Fraser Valley, where these properties are now worth millions of dollars when they were originally purchased for maybe $300,000, $400,000, where they thought the whole entire thing was tax exempt. And up until the point of passing, yes, it's tax exempt, but then they sat on the property for perhaps another year waiting for it to close. And in the, in the span of that one year, the property actually increased by another million dollars. You're looking at a million dollar capital gain tax to the estate. And because an estate is filed like a trust, okay, it's taxed at the highest marginal rate and that's dollar for dollar. So you're looking at potentially a 25% tax on that capital gain. So we've had instances where unfortunately unawares individuals are now, you know, using that $1 million as an example, facing a $250,000 tax bill. So again, something to be very, very careful about uh, with regards to principal residences. And, and I think one little thing here that we'll just quickly briefly uh, chat on before I bore you guys with tax and I'll turn it back over to Steve is uh, if you do own a corporation, you'll want to make sure you're sitting down with your tax advisor, with your financial advisor and, and your lawyer as well to make sure that you've actually got the right uh, processes in place. Because again, if you're not uh, careful, thank you Steve, if you're not careful, uh, there's a potential three layers of tax. There's that deemed disposition upon passing, which we talked about, but then if your beneficiaries inherit those shares and they look to perhaps sell some of the assets inside the company, whether it's intangible property, whether these are actual taxable property or actual uh, assets that we actually have inside a business, there's a second layer of tax for selling those assets. And then there's a third layer of a tax on the same amounts when those beneficiaries look to pull that money out of that corporate uh, entity. Uh, and that might be in the form of a salary tax or a dividend tax. Again, it's very inefficient and something that a lot of business owners are not aware of, uh, of course, and, and is something that you should take into consideration well, you know, well in advance. Uh, and this is, for example, something like an estate, estate freeze, succession planning, which can take years and depending on family dynamics can take on very interesting uh, characteristics. I'm currently working on three right now and it's just nothing is ever cookie cutter. Everything's different. Every, every single person is different. Every business owner is different. So it's just very interesting trying to work through those uh, with their lawyers uh, and, and other advisors. And then funding tax requirements. So this is where that life insurance comes in, perhaps corporately held life insurance. And like Steve was saying, you don't wanna have these obviously included in your will. So you wanna make sure that if you are putting this inside say a holding company or, or another corporation, for example, that you have a certain set of shares that are tied to that life insurance policy. So that life insurance actually streams out on a tax efficient basis uh, so life insurance actually streams out about 94, 96% tax-free, okay, upon your date of passing, but you want to tie a, a preferred set of shares to that life insurance policy, so it actually goes out to your designated beneficiaries. Again, because it's not covered by a will, you don't want to have that probatable, but at the same time, you want to be able to have those proceeds go to the right person. Again, that's planning that you want to make sure you have in place. And the last thing, I'll probably switch this back to Steve, is, is corporate wills. Is something, especially if you own a considerable amount of assets, they want to take a look, uh, take a look at. It is uh, something that you can use, perhaps depending on your situation, as a substitute for an alter ego trust uh, to help uh, mitigate any probate tax, especially if you're looking at a corporate group that could be, say, in the millions, and then that probate tax does start to make a financial impact. Steve, it's back to you. Thanks so much for that, Ryan. That was awesome. Um, yeah, so just briefly on the corporate wills. Uh, so yeah, if you do hold shares uh, in a company or a series of companies, shares are a type of asset that can fall outside of your estate and uh, does not need to be subject to, to probate. So recently, uh, a number of three, four years ago, uh, there was a court case that set a precedent for the use of multiple wills of having one will that governs uh, your personal assets, and then and the one that governs uh, shares or, and other assets. This, is, this could include things such as art, 
um, other things that uh, that you don't require probate for, uh, which can end up saving your estate quite a bit of money. Um, the other thing while we're on the topic of multiple wills is if you hold property in multiple jurisdictions, uh, it's a very good idea to hold to have wills in each of those jurisdictions. So if you, for example, if you hold if you have a property in Mexico or in California or Hawaii or uh, elsewhere, then you're going to need to consult with a lawyer in those jurisdictions to ensure that um, that you have the proper planning in place. You can't just rely on on one will, unfortunately, to to govern it all. Um, although it, that can work, but it's um, it's a bit of a roll of the dice. You want to make sure that you consult with the advisors in in each jurisdiction where you where you uh, where you hold property. Next slide. So incapacity. So um, unfortunately, uh, there, there generally is a period of incapacity before, uh, before anyone dies, uh, whether it's physical or mental or both. And so there are uh, three essential documents, re really two essential documents that I believe everybody should have. Uh, the third is sort of more um, boils down to personal preference. But um, enduring power of attorney, and this is really something that everybody should have at whatever age you're at, because um, we all know that life is unpredictable. So the, an enduring power of attorney is a document that covers financial and legal decisions. So it grants authority to somebody who's called an attorney. Uh, they don't need to be a lawyer. It's just sort of a, a weird term that, uh, that gets employed, but, um, they're called your attorney and, uh, and that person, um, can make decisions. They can deal with your bank accounts. They can deal with your financial advisors, your, your accountant, your lawyer, um, make all, all kinds of decisions. So it's a, it's obviously a, a very high trust, um, appointment. So you of course want to, uh, only choose somebody that you, you have full faith in. And, and that is also, um, administratively savvy, you know, somebody who is sophisticated enough to, to know how to deal with these types of things. So, uh, not somebody to, um, appoint if you don't want to appoint somebody who's very disorganized, for example, if you can avoid it. Um, so it's called an enduring power of attorney as opposed to a normal power of attorney because it endures after you lose incapacity. Um, whereas a general power of attorney, it might be something that you put in place for a period of time when you're uh, just unavailable. So you're on vacation or you just, you know, you're, you're meditating for six months and you just can't be reached. So yeah, without, without a, a power of attorney, uh, even your spouse can't sign for you. So even if you hold a property in joint tenancy with your spouse and you need to sell it, uh, your spouse can't do that for you unless, um, unless you have the power of attorney in place. So very important to, to get that done. Second document is called a representation agreement. And it's basically like a power of attorney except for healthcare decisions. So this document appoints a representative um, and often an alternative representative to make these types of decisions. And it also sets out what types of decisions they can make and which ones they can't. So this can include things like where you receive care into your old age. Um, so they can decide whether you're gonna be transferred to a care facility and also make uh, various, various healthcare decisions, including um, when, to, when to pull the plug. So um, if you're on life support, so this is a great document to have in place. If you don't have a representation agreement, uh, your spouse does have authority to make these kinds of decisions and, um, and then your kids do as well. Um, but if you don't have any spouse or kids, then no one has a, this authority, including your parents, unless you're a minor. Uh, finally, the last document is called a living will or advanced directive. Uh, this is similar to a representation agreement except it's more, uh, more of a, a statement of wishes. So this is basically guidelines that your um, healthcare representatives would, would need to follow. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the incapacity documents are, are generally what are created alongside of a will. Um, generally the process is to, to handle everything at once. So, so if you, would like to consult with me to, to discuss that, uh, I'd be happy to do so. And you can just send, um, send me an email afterwards. So this is our contact information here. Um, this is my email, which I'm sure you guys already have and Ryan's as well. And um, I'm going to 
turn off um, screen share and just open it up to questions. So if you have any questions, uh, please, please let me know. Um, you can just turn your, there's only 14 people here. So if you want to uh, put yourself off mute, um, feel free to do so, or just type it into the chat and um, Ryan or myself will, will get to your question. And if there's no questions, that's fine too. But uh, we will we'll just give it a couple of minutes, perhaps to, if you're trying to figure out how to express your question. Um, I noticed that we have some people here that I know are from out of province, uh, are not from BC. So yeah, it's um, it's essential that you work with a, with an advisor, um, particularly on the legal side, who is from your province. So. Um, Unfortunately, I, I can't. I can't help you if uh, if you're not a British Columbia resident for your for your will, because every every province is different in how they have set things up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll uh, I'll follow up with you, Sky, about that. Um, Jeffrey. So, what process is involved with regard to a will if you currently have a small corporation with one shareholder? Um, so, Jeffrey, great question. So. It depends on the value of the corporation. So if, if the corporation does have a significant value, then it, it is worth looking into um, having multiple wills. So having a separate corporate will as well as a regular will. Um, so happy to talk about that further with you, um, but probably a discussion that's best to do off offline um, for the sake of confidentiality for one. But uh, yeah, so please please feel free to follow up with me, Jeffrey. Um, you can uh, you can shoot me an email and we can get into that a little bit further. Ryan, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Anything anything that came up? Yeah, no, thanks, Steve. I think um, I think generally just for everybody, I think, you know, it's it's a good point. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of like going to the dentist. Nobody likes to ever do that, but. Uh, a good point is, you know what, having these regular check-ins, of course, with your tax advisor, uh, your lawyer, and your financial advisor at the same time, um, they, they should be working together. Uh, I can't tell you how uh, beneficial it's been for a lot of our high net worth individuals and our client groups that were able to, of course, uh, you know, work together with Steve uh, amongst uh, other lawyers uh, and, and financial advisors that the client may have in order to provide a, a combined approach. It's, it's important, specifically uh, when you are sitting on corporate assets to plan ahead. Uh, unfortunately, nobody ever wants to think about it. Uh, I don't like thinking about it, but uh, nothing's guaranteed and you never know. Uh, and especially if you do have a family and corporate assets or say substantial real estate, uh, that is something that you'll want to make sure that you do have the proper planning in place. And that, uh, again, uh, if you are looking at insurance as an option to make sure that that's been set up correctly, I know there's a lot of individuals, unfortunately, who are putting together policies um, that may not be specifically correct um, for your situation. So again, whenever you're working on an insurance uh, approach, make sure that you are working with a good tax advisor who understands uh, that structure and make sure, of course, again, like uh, something like Steve, a good lawyer who also understands uh, how that needs to be structured from a, a share perspective. I think that'd be very important, uh, Steve, uh, to mention, of course, to, to the viewers. And I think the other big thing as well, too, is especially for those principal residences and for other personally held assets, again, you may want to consider a meltdown strategy. So again, it's sitting down with a financial advisor and your lawyer taking a look at, okay, well, maybe I've got, and we see this really, really common, we, you know, somebody who's done nothing but diligently saved, um, they've got me 1.5 to $2 million in RSP. And it's something that now, you know, what they want to take a look at paying out uh, over a RIF or, you know, financing their retirement uh, and, you know and unfortunately that person you know uh, passes away unexpectedly and now you know the estate and there's no surviving spouse uh, the estate's now got uh, quite a large hit so again something that that would be a discussion with your financial advisor something to take a look at uh, at those items and especially if you're holding uh, properties personally uh, rental properties for example again 
uh, like Steve pointed out, especially a lot of people do like to hold these in joint tenancy, something that you want to think about in regards to, okay, wait, well, how are these going to be laid out? Where is the tax hit going to be in terms of the capital gain? Is that coming on my final return and so forth? So I, I would I would assume that that's something that you'd want to take care of with your, with your lawyer and your financial advisor and of course your tax account too. Thanks very much, Ryan. Ryan, could you just speak briefly to uh, you know, what you mean by a meltdown strategy? What is that melting down? Yeah, no worries. Meltdown is kind of just like, uh, it's kind of a terminology that we use uh, obviously in, in the tax and uh, finance world and meltdown is more like just literally what it is, melting down your assets. So what you'll do is you'll sit down. Um, I think the ba best way to do is to sit down with your financial advisor and this is usually what we encourage our clients and potential clients to, to do is uh, sit down with your financial advisor, uh, go through your assets that you currently hold, all your corporate assets. For example, if, you, if you're a small business owner or, or, or a medium sized business owner or what have you, put those to one side, take a look at all the personal assets, take a look at say the holding company and so forth and take a look at what's not covered by insurance if, you, if, you don't, uh, if you're using that strategy. And then take a look at, you know, do I need to start melting down my RSPs? So do I need to start withdrawing more than what I need to for my RSPs and perhaps giving those out? Uh, are there charitable solutions? Uh, so for example, should I be taking more income out? Again, uh, you know, when you do gift shares or when you gift uh, or when you sell an asset to gift, obviously you have to be careful with capital gains tax. Um, so taking a look at perhaps if certain investments or real estate's in a loss. And same way, you know, I do want this to be transferred out to my son or my daughter, or to perhaps another member of my family. Maybe now is a good time to do it because maybe the value has decreased. So melting down is basically taking a look at the assets that you hold, cherry picking the ones that make the most sense to move. If it makes sense, of course, from a family dynamic perspective, uh, if you know that you are going to be giving a portion of these assets away to uh, other members of your family, uh, or perhaps even on a charitable basis. Uh, that's something that you'll want to take a look at. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, we just had a question from Addison about uh, digital assets. So yeah, of course, this is an area that often gets overlooked. And um, yeah, if you can include a list of passwords and digital credentials for, uh, for your next of kin, that's very, very helpful. Uh, this is sort of a tricky area. And of course, because people tend to change their passwords over time. And uh, unless you're really diligent and are constantly updating that list, then uh, this can create a real headache. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I personally use services, a service called LastPass and, um, you know, that's something, there are various uh, password managers that uh, you might want to consider uh, making use of and, um, and then providing access to, uh, to your executors, to the, to the persons who are going to be managing your estate. Um, but yeah, that's a bit of a tricky one, of course, because who knows what technology is going to look like in, five years, 10 years, 50 years. So. Yeah. Um, just to, uh, just to kind of tag off the back of Steve on that one again, CRA is always going to want to get their cut. Uh, so again, Addison, of course, uh, you know, if we're taking a look at say crypto or taking a look at uh, say, for example, other digital uh, assets like IP, um, other items that perhaps have some sort of value to them, uh, you've got to be very careful again of that valuation and how CRA could potentially come back on a digitally held portfolio. Uh, anything has value if it can be assessed. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and uh, taking time out of your day to, to learn about this. Like, like Ryan said, this can be a little bit like going to the dentist. So uh, good on you for, uh, for being willing to, um, to confront this topic. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to both of us. Uh, I think by now, both of you, everybody knows how to get a hold of both of us. So. Um, yeah, thanks very much for joining. And there will be a replay uh, available. So um, that should get sent out to you automatically through because you guys registered. Uh, but if it doesn't, uh, if you're having trouble accessing it and you'd like to review the information that was shared here, uh, just feel free to email me directly and, uh, and I will make sure that you get the proper link. Ryan, thanks very much for joining us today, man. Uh, really appreciate your time. No, Steve, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, thank you as well for all the uh, participants uh, to listening. Really appreciate you guys' time, obviously, of course, on a busy Tuesday morning. So thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.